So reads the word of God. Join me now in a further moment of prayer. Father, we come now before you seeking, Lord, your blessings upon, Lord, your word as we have heard it, Lord. So now may it search our hearts and our minds. May we come to know, Lord, in a greater way your love for us. So that, Father, we might be moved to love you more. Teach us now from your word. Use me, Father, as your servant now to speak uh, your word, to give its explanation. And then, Father, as only you can, for your glory, make application of it now to the hearts of these that are here in this place. O God, be now our guide and our help. For this I ask in Jesus' name, and amen. This title, The Love of God, expresses not only the virtue of love that is found in God, that God loves, but it speaks of his nature. It speaks to who he is. That he is love. That he is love personified. So when talking about the love of God, we must assert this, that God never finds love. That is, there is never a point in time when God begins to love. And, and, and here's, here's what I mean by this. In Jeremiah chapter 31 in verse 3, the Lord tells Jeremiah this. He tells him that, he, that his love for him is, is an everlasting love. Listen, listen to these words now. This is Jeremiah chapter 31 in verse 3. The Lord hath appeared of old unto me, Jeremiah writes, saying... I have loved thee with an everlasting love, therefore with loving kindness have I drawn thee. So you see what is being said here that about this love of God, that it is here described as an everlasting love. Now it's interesting, that word in the Hebrew that is translated here in our English translation as everlasting, that it carries the thought of of ancient time, of of, of time past. But, But not only that, but that word, as I understand it, also has meaning concerning the future that it carries this thought not only of ancient times past, but also of forever. This love, as it is given, is done so, therefore, from a time perspective that is an indefinite one. And so what God says to Jeremiah about his love for him being an everlasting love, we could replace Jeremiah with ourselves as those who are in Christ, who are God, that God has loved us with an everlasting love. Well, what does that, what does that mean for us? Well, I think it probably can mean a number of things, but primarily the, the meaning that I would have you to consider is this, that this love of God must therefore be unconditional. That is, his love for Jeremiah, and, and, and by application, his love for the church today, is a love that is not based upon merit. Uh, his love is not dependent upon the presence of certain, certain conditions in us. And that is apparent here in in this text from Deuteronomy. Or is it? Now, in the advertising world, 
that or is it would be what is known as a teaser. And so I want you to kind of consider that for a moment. Is it? Is it really? Look with me at beginning at verse 6. Now, because in the previous verses, now to verse 6, Moses has reminded the people of Israel of the promises of God, of their possessing the land of Canaan and how he warned them not to have any ties with the Canaanites and all the people of the land, how they were not to intermarry with them and how they were to burn down all of their altars and so forth. But here in verse 6 is why it was that they were to do these things. Because you notice in verse 6 that very first word, for. For thou art a holy people unto the Lord thy God. And then notice he says this, The Lord thy God hath chosen thee to be a special people unto himself above all people that are upon the face of the earth. Now note the absence here of conditions. There's no mention of conditions here for this love of God. And we see that in verse 7. The Lord, it says, did not set his love upon you nor choose you because ye were more in number than any people for ye were the fewest of all people. And I think, brothers and sisters, not just... Not just that thought of numbers here, but we're to understand the, what is implied here that there is really nothing, nothing at all that, from, that the people had in their own way and upon their own selves that would merit God choosing them or to show us love. But simply it just says in verse 8, the reason why God chose Israel The nation of Israel, it is because the Lord loved you. Now, I think a couple of things to note here. And the first is this, that the Lord here, as we understand that word Lord, Jehovah or Yahweh, the significance of that name, Yahweh, or as he made himself known to Moses there at the burning bush, I am. The, the, the idea of, of God being the eternal, the eternal one, who has always existed. And brothers and sisters, what we should understand here is, is that God finds total fulfillment in just his own being. And by that, that is, he doesn't need anyone in order to find his joy or his worth. He is, in in this way, self-sufficient. But here we are to understand that out of mere grace, and we could also say for his glory, he chose to make a certain people, a certain known number of people, to be his people. The Lord hath chosen thee. Speaking here of the people of Israel, those descendants of Jacob, as you may remember, Jacob's name being changed to Israel, and the sons of Jacob then becoming the twelve tribes of Israel. That the Lord thy God hath chosen thee, to be a special people unto himself above all the people of the earth. And again, brothers and sisters, friends, notice the basis for him doing this. It is simply, as verse 8 says, it is because the Lord loved you. Nothing inherent among the people of Israel that made them to stand out, whereby they then earned this favored status with God. That God simply chose to love them. And that love here is, is unconditional. It was an everlasting love. A love that existed before even they existed. And, and so, brothers and sisters, so it is, I think, as we make application of this thought here, so it is to be with the church, the called out ones, 
called out by God, called out by grace, not of merit. And so, I, this, the, I hope you be, are beginning to see now why I, I chose this passage to speak on in consideration of this great theme of the love of God. Because Israel in the Old Testament is a picture of, or a better, a type of, uh, uh, in many ways, the church of, of the Lord Jesus Christ. The church of the New Testament, in the New Testament. It, it is representative It is uh, of us here at Lane's. For God's love, we could say, certainly is a passionate love. It is a perfect love, and it is an unconditional love. It's just as true for us here today as it was in the day when Moses addressed the Israelites to say that the love of the Lord, or the Lord rather, did not set his love upon you, nor choose you because you were more in number than any other people. There is nothing about us in our own that would move God to love us or to choose us. We are his people because he has chosen to love us with an everlasting love. Now, now here's where we come to that teaser that I mentioned to you before. Because what is particular to Israel in the Old Testament... Israel as a nation is that God's blessings upon them and I would contend his promise to continue to love them was in a sense conditioned upon their keeping his law. They were to obey him. And and, and here's where I look, look at this at verse 12. Wherefore, it shall come to pass, if ye hearken to these judgments, and keep and do them, that the Lord thy God shall keep unto thee the covenant and the mercy which he sware unto thy fathers. And then look at verse 13. And, what? He will love thee. So, Let's, let me stop right there and draw your attention to this word if here. If you hearken to these judgments, if you keep and do them, what are these statements? These are conditioned or conditional statements. So it would appear here that a condition has been given for God to continue to show his love for Israel, for the nation of Israel. And that condition is ultimately their obedience, their faithfulness to honor their covenantal obligations before him, to love him and to serve him only. And then we notice that there's more here and that there is this list of things that the Lord uh, pledged uh, to do out of his love for them. Out of their, uh, uh, upon the condition of their obedience and their faithfulness to him, to honor their covenantal obligations before him, to love him and to serve him only, we see these list of different things here. And I'll briefly just mention them. He will bless them by causing them to multiply. He will bless them such that the womb, you see, would be fruitful, that there would be many children. Then he will bless them by giving them bountiful harvests. He will bless them with great numbers of livestock. You see that in verse 13. Then notice as well, he will bless them with health. Verse 14, and, and the Lord will take away all from thee all sickness and will put none of the evil diseases of Egypt uh, which thou knowest upon thee, but what he will do then, will he will lay them upon them that hate thee. And, and here we see as well how he will care for them, not only in preserving them, but also in defeating their enemies. As the Lord, verse 18, as the Lord did unto Pharaoh and to Egypt, so will he do to the nations who seek to do harm to his people. And then verse 24, and he shall deliver their kings into thine hand, 
and thou shalt destroy their name from under heaven, and, and so forth. You see, these are all benefits, the blessings of God that come from the Lord, that comes, yes, because of his love that he has for them, but also because he demands of them that they love him. Now, what about this? Because I said to you that the love of God is a love that is unconditional. His love, as seen in the passage in Jeremiah, is said to be an everlasting love. So how is it then that we see here, and I I think it could be said explicitly, but also implicitly, that for God to continue to love his people, his people must obey him. I, I, there seems to be here a contradiction. For God's love for us cannot be both unconditional and also conditioned at the same time, can it? That, that, doesn't, make, that doesn't make sense. It, that we can't, that's not logical. Now, to this, Israel, we know, as a nation, ultimately failed to honor their covenantal obligations to love and obey God. And because of their rebellion against God, there is this thought, their sense of that God rejected them. And, and of course, that's a rebellion, as I guess, in, in, as the nation of Israel as a whole. Uh, the Jews today, most of the Jews, continue to, to rebel against God in that they deny the divinity and the lordship of Jesus Christ. And Jesus would seem to make a reference to this rejection in, in Matthew's gospel in chapter 21 in the parable of the two sons when he said this in, chap- in verse 42. Did you ever read in the scriptures, the stone with the builders rejected the same as become the head of the corner? This is the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. Therefore say I unto you, the kingdom of God shall be taken from you. And who is he talking about there? The Pharisees, right? The leaders, the, the religious leaders of the Jews. The kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a nation bringing forth the fruits thereof. And whosoever shall fall on this stone shall be broken, but on whomsoever it shall fall, it will grind him to powder. Now, for the sake of time, I would just say there is much here about this subject of God's rejection of the nation of Israel that that certainly is a point of controversy. Is it a final rejection? Or is there a time coming when Israel as a whole will once again Uh, be converted and and they they will come to believe in Jesus and and there will be this great day of conversion. Uh, I'm somewhat unsettled about this in in my own mind. I have thoughts about that but but I don't want to go into into all of that. Simply I want to end the message this morning by resolving the supposed contradiction that I mentioned to you of God's love. Is it, is it unconditional or is it conditioned? And here's how I want to resolve that. And here's where this Advent theme of the love of God is, for, is to be seen by us. By faith, by faith, we look into the manger at Bethlehem. And we see this child that has been born. And what we see there, when we see that child by faith, we see that he, that he is the one who resolves this contradiction, this seeming contradiction. He is the reason 
for God's love, being an everlasting love. In the hymn that we're going to sing in a moment, Charles Wesley, I think, in, in, in one of the verses there, helps us to see what I'm speaking about. Where he writes this, Come, desire of nations, come, fix in us thy humble home. Rise the woman's conquering seed. Bruise in us the serpent's head. Adam's likeness now efface. And that word efface means to destroy. Adam's likeness now efface. Stamp thine image in its place. Second Adam from above. Second Adam being Jesus, the child in the manger. Second Adam from above. And then this statement. Reinstate us in thy love. The answer to how God's love is an everlasting one and an unconditional one is simply Jesus. Why? Because Jesus did what it is that you and I could never do. Jesus did what the nation of Israel couldn't do in obeying God in loving God with all of their heart, soul, mind, and strength. What did Jesus say to his disciples in the Sermon on the Mount? I came not to what? Do away with the law, but rather to what? To fulfill it. And because you see Jesus kept the law perfectly. As we would say, every jot and tittle. Well, we wouldn't say that because we're not Jewish. We don't know Hebrew. But he crossed every T and he dotted every I concerning the law. And Because Jesus kept the law perfectly, he was sinless. Jesus then does what? He becomes our righteousness. Jesus, in his fulfillment of the law, has, has now made us to be just before God. You see, with Israel of old, they are not only a type of how God chooses a people to be his own, but they are further a type of how on their own they could never uphold God's commandment to obey him. The righteousness they needed in order to continue in the love of God must therefore be what? What is known as an alien righteousness. That is, it must be a righteousness that comes from without. From without of themselves. You see, brothers and sisters, friends, without this righteousness that we are talking about here, we are enemies of God. We are enemies with God. God hates, and that's a hard thing to say, but God hates his enemies. It, there, there's a saying that I know that you all heard at some time or another of God hating the sin, but loving the sinners. That may sound wonderful, but it's not biblical. God does not judge sin and then cast sin into the fires of hell. But God judges sinners. 
he cast sinners into hell. God hates the sinner who sins and does so without any desire at all to repent of those sins. That's, that's hard. That's a hard saying. I understand that. But listen to Psalm 5 and verse 5. The foolish shall not stand in thy sight. Thou hatest all workers of iniquity. Psalm 11, verse 5. The Lord trieth the righteous, but the wicked and him that loveth violence, his soul hateth. And so, brothers and sisters, the the reason as we come back now for God's love, being an everlasting love and an unconditional love, it's because he loves you through his son. Through his son, Jesus. For in Jesus, our sins are forgiven. God sees us now With the righteousness, not of ourselves, not from within ourselves, but he sees us as having the righteousness of his son, Jesus Christ. Which is what I understand in part what John means when he writes this in 1 John chapter 3, verse 9, Whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin, for his seed remaineth in him. And he cannot sin because he is born of God. In this the children of God are manifest and the children of the devil. Whosoever doeth not righteousness is not of God. Neither he that loveth not his brother. You know, it's not that we don't commit sins. Because everyone here still does that. But it's that because being born again, being believers in the Lord Jesus Christ, and having the righteousness of Christ as our righteousness, that our nature now is no longer to love to sin. But it is to love God. William Barclay, a Scottish theologian and and noted author, author said this, Jesus' coming is the final and unanswerable proof that God cares. I I would just amend that, or add to it rather, Jesus' coming is final and unanswerable proof that God's love is an everlasting love. Jesus' coming is the final and unanswerable proof That God's love is an unconditional love. 1 John 4, 7. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God. And everyone that loveth is born of God and knoweth God. He that loveth not knoweth not God, for God is love. In this was manifested the love of God toward us because that God sent his only begotten son into the world that we might live through him. And that's what I mean by saying that the love of God for us is a love that is based upon the work of his only begotten son and not because of any works that we have. Herein is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his Son to be the propitiation for our sins. Israel of old was to respond to the love of God by loving him with all of their heart, soul, mind, and strength 
Though as a nation, we could say today that they failed to do that. Let us not fail to do this. To love God with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. Let us not fail to love our neighbors as ourselves. You know, we work not the works of righteousness to earn now the love of God or to keep in the love of God. But rather we work the works of righteousness out of our love for God who first loved us. We do works of righteousness. In other words, we obey him as a response now for the love of God that was manifested in this great truth that the word of God became flesh and dwelt among us. This is the love of God. This is the love that we think of in this season of Advent, the first Advent. But you know what? It's also the same with the second Advent. Because it's going to be out of the love of God for us that he comes again to take us back to be with him, body and soul, forever. Jesus' coming is the final and unanswerable proof that God cares, that God loves. God loves to love us. Isn't that the message of Christmas?